Good morning. Good morning. Um, let's just see. Welcome, Sivrielu and Anna Marie, to workshop number four the econ um, economic and management science at UFS, mapping out the student life cycle and evidence based decisions. Um, you, it's 10 o'clock. It seems like everybody's here, and I'm sure we can go ahead. Okay. It's all yours, Anna Marie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmelita and Elizabeth. Um, sorry, just want to stop my video this side. Yes, there I am. Um, I just want to say, yes, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. My name is Anneri Miller. Um, I'm from the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences from the University of the Free State. I'm the Teaching and Learning Manager here. Um, but we want to thank you for this opportunity to just share with you some of the data analytics, learner analytics that, that we are currently busy with. Um, and, you know, to, to have you join in this conversation and have us, even us, the opportunity to join in the conversation um, is such a privilege. So, um, as you saw, uh, we are presenting on mapping out the student life cycle and making evidence based decisions. So, yeah, I just want to use this. There we go. All right. So the facilitators, um, it, the, the workshop today will pre be presented by myself. I'm the teaching and learning manager at the EMS faculty, but also our data analyst in the faculty, Mr. Siwile Nzameni, he will be joining me and co-presenting, uh, being a co-presenter in this, in this workshop. So just to give some context, uh, we are basically the teaching and learning office. We have some other colleagues here as well uh, in our office, but we are a subset of the dean's office in the faculty. And we are, are very much concerned or tasked with, uh, or, you know, we are passionate about uh, student success. Uh, so student support, uh, uh, academic support, we provide academic support, uh, fostering and promoting the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, and we also assist uh, the dean and the faculty manager, our faculty marketer, with elements of the student life cycle, such things like uh, admissions policy, you know, curriculum design, PQM, those type of things. So uh, I think let us jump into it. Sigo, I don't know if you want to quickly switch on your camera, just to say hi. There we go. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. I think I'm going to stop my video now and get into this. Okay. Fantastic. So we embarked on this, this uh, analysis or process of the word of mapping out the student life cycle. But to start off with, what is the student life cycle? What is stu uh, the student life cycle management? So if we are an office of the Dean, so this is our context, we are here in middle management. Um, so what is it that we want to manage and why do we want to manage it? So um, just here from the California State University cited that the student life cycle framework is used by educational leaders to help with support service analysis, prediction and planning and can also be used to help design new and creative ways to improve first year retention and student success, overall student success. And the analysis that we will be sharing here today is very much focused on, on, on retention and, and graduation and student success. Um, in line with this, we've also seen that making use of a student life cycle framework is a big drive uh, nationally, internationally, Nationally, I know there's, there's this big uh, drive at WITS under Prof. Diane Grayston to improve student success through a holistic uh, student life cycle framework. Now, student life cycle that, you know, of course, is from, uh, from entry, recruitment, you know, looking at data and, and uh, analytical aspects of our students and information from recruitment all the way up until graduation and even post-graduation. So uh, 
Pravi Govinda in a 2020 posted an article indicating that student life cycle management is a data-driven approach of an educational institution that focuses on the entire student journey right from the very first time the student becomes aware of the institution through to admissions and then on to alumni. So we uh, do we as a teaching and learning office, subset of the Dean's office fit in with the student life cycle? I think all of us sitting here are involved in the student life cycle. Um, but as I mentioned, we assist with admission criteria, so designing policy and assisting with a, a policy around admissions. Uh, we assist academics with curriculum development and, and PQM. Uh, and then also student support at identifying and providing uh, designing interventions for at-risk students, for example. And then marketing, not so much in our office specifically, but the marketing of our programs uh, is very much uh, a, a priority for the Dean's office as well. We do have a, a faculty specific marketer addressing that specific uh, uh, part of the life cycle. Today, what we will be sharing with you is just a, a focused look on the life cycle, specifically from where students enter uh, uh, the higher education environment, specifically the UFS and an EMS program up until graduation. So what I want to share with you here is a typical life cycle at uh, the EMS faculty at the University of the Pre-State. So um, maybe just starting from the back there, I think it's easier to, 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 to go from the back. So for a student to ultimately graduate with a bachelor's degree, at the, uh, at the University of the Free State at, at the EMS faculty, they can enroll for a mainstream program. Typically, we uh, this is a, a three-year qualification, a BCom or a B admin qualification. So we've got two streams there in the EMS faculty, <clears throat> uh, a three-year program. Our admission requirements is a, a, an AP score, so a minimum AP score of 28. And then, of, of course, also we have a minimum NSC math requirement. Should students not meet that initial or, or, or qualification admission requirements for the mainstream program directly, we do provide access to students through our extended program. So either they didn't meet the AP uh, and the, or they didn't meet the math, uh, then they can enter the, uh, uh, the EMS faculty or one of our uh, uh, qualifications through the extended program. Uh, the minimum time here is four years. So their first year of the curriculum design there is very much uh, focused on a development, uh, developmental modules that we include, you know, for the development of skills and supporting our students to be successful in the mainstream programs once they progress to their chosen uh, mainstream program. And because, uh, of course, before that, we have our recruitment and our prospective students that then either enter through the extended program or the mainstream qualification. Um, like I mentioned, we've got two, two streams. We've got our BCom stream in the EMS faculty, which we have subdivided actually into a financial stream and a non-financial stream. So the financial stream is our uh, qualifications that has a higher math requirement, uh, NSC math requirement in the, in the admi uh, for admission. Um, and then the non-financial, and then of course the, the B admin stream that has no math requirement and students can enter without any math. So this is the typical life cycle of a student, but what we've seen and what we've experienced at the EMS faculty at UFS is that students can or may or are possibly using our higher certificate. So this is our one year qualification, our higher certificate. We've got one in commerce and we've got one in admin. So for both streams, we do have a higher certificate that we offer. And it seems to us that students are using the higher certificate as a mechanism to access a mainstream qualification. So this of course, uh, uh, asks or lead us to ask a couple of questions. Is this in fact the case? What is the trend there? Um, if the students are entering uh, uh, through a higher certificate, then progressing to extended program, then progressing to a mainstream qualification, are they successful? 
Um, and if they are successful, are they successful in minimum time? And if they are not successful, uh, what extra support measures can we provide to support our students? Further, not only to student success, but also to curriculum design, you know, is our higher certificate, if this is the trend, is our higher certificate as it is currently designed fit for purpose? So these are a couple of questions that we would like to address. Um, so the first thing we did is to go and look whether in fact the data substantiates this hunch. So what we have on the screen here is uh, basically some descriptives of four cohorts of higher certificate students. So the green bars uh, represent our students entering through the higher certificate in admin. And the blue bars represent the students entering the higher certificate in the commerce route. So a student uh, that enters the higher certificate graduates, graduating from the higher certificate after the one year, they do have uh, in the design, they do have the opportunity to articulate or progress to the extended program, ultimately following a mainstream program. So in 2017, in our 2017 cohort, 61% of our, of our admin students did come back after the higher certificate and enrolled into the extended program. In the BCom route, that is 88%, my apologies, 88% of our commerce higher certificate students came back the following year and enrolled in the BCom extended program. And this trend we do see and exists across all four cohorts here. So we do see that students are moving from a higher certificate to an extended program, ultimately with the aim of graduating uh, in one of our mainstream programs. And that's now where, where I come and ask the question, um, is our higher certificate, if this is what the students are doing, is our higher certificate fit for purpose? Now, according to the HEQSF, our higher certificate is primarily vocational, with a strong industry orientated focus. It typically includes aspects such, such as will, work integrated learning, simulated work experience. Um, but we do see that, and it is a, a, a possible for a student to then use this higher certificate as a method of entry into our mainstream programs. So back to basics. <laughs> We have to go back to the drawing board. Let's see, is our curriculum design fit for purpose? Are our students successful? So our problem statement basically is if the higher certificate is being used as an access mechanism to a formal bachelor's degree, are we providing this opportunity to our students? They are doing this. So are we providing this to our students uh, with the, the, the purpose of having access with success, or is it access versus success? So we embarked on this learning analytics uh, exercise that we will share with you to determine whether students entering the highest certificate programs successfully progress to and graduate with a relevant mainstream qualification from our faculty to inform our decision making in terms of admission requirements. There's a lot of uh, uh, decisions that such an analysis could be useful for in terms of our enrollment planning, like I mentioned, our curriculum design, graduation targets, uh, what, what, what our graduation rates are looking for at and what do we want to target in future. Um, if students are successful, what pathway do they follow? If students are not successful, how can we identify them timeously and provide a focused support to our at-risk students? And then of course, the, the resource allocation, decisions around resource allocation in terms of our higher certificate and the financial viability. So with this background and context in mind of why we embarked on our analysis, um, we would like to ask uh, uh, or to, to now have a group discussion. So we are going to give 10 minutes group discussion time. Um, we'll, I don't know whether it will be Elizabeth or Carmelita that will be assisting us, but we will be dividing the forum 
into five groups with 10 minutes discussion time. Um, and we ask that you please assign a leader, a scribe and a timekeeper so that we can manage the time efficiently. And then afterwards provide five minutes feedback per group uh, uh, from your discussions and your views and the, you know, how you might go about such an analysis. But we would like to also provide you with some prompts, so we're not just leaving you there in the woods to, 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 to uh, uh, facilitate this discussion. So we've got two prompts, two things that we would like you to please address and think about. The first is which indicators are important in measuring the success of the higher certificate, of the students in the higher certificate, in light of this problem statement of students going and uh, progressing to a, a mainstream program, are they equipped? What analytics and or tools would you need to convince decision makers that the higher certificate is indeed or is not a mechanism for access to success or access with success? in higher education. So we will be providing you with, with a document, a Google Docs document uh, with, with these uh, uh, prompts to, to assist you to facilitate the discussion. Sibu, if you can maybe just pop the links into the chat, I would really appreciate that. So um, after they are in the chat, I'm just going to give a minute for everyone to please copy uh, the the links, because um, you will be randomly assigned. We don't know who is going to be in group one or who's going to be in group four. So if you can please copy all, uh, all five links. Um, and then once you have been assigned, randomly assigned to your groups, please use the link for your specific group um, in, in, in guiding your discussions and, and jotting down your thoughts around these two, two questions. Um, let me just see in the chat, sorry. Okay, so Sivu, uh, you dropped down the Word document. So if everyone can maybe just give them, I'm just giving a minute for everyone to download that or, or copy that. Um, Elizabeth, just want to ask about the logistics. Will you be assisting with the groups? Yes, I've already created the five groups. Uh, there will be people helping with um, you as well or the, the people in the groups as well. So um, yes. yeah, it's sorted. Okay, so it's cheetah, lion, elephant. Is, is that for our group? Yes, so automatically people will, will go into their group when I open it. Okay, oh, fantastic. Um, just before we do that, uh, any questions from, uh, from, the, from the platform? Can you please just put the links again? Sure, sure. I think maybe I'm going to copy them outside of the Word document. Okay. There we go. Right. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're really looking forward to, uh, in, in, in light of this situation that we are, we're faced with and the, the questions that we answer, we're really excited about having, having your inputs and your thoughts and your views on this. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think we can then move to the group discussions, after which we will come back to the main room for the five minutes feedback per, per group by the leader. Thank you so much. Elizabeth? Hi. Hi, can we do another take of the screenshots again, please? Um, maybe just after the session at the end of that, if you can, please, man. 
Um, okay. Can you do it before, okay. bef before break? Yes, before the next break. Yeah. Um, yeah, Takanlani and I just chatted now and we see that we need an, a better a screenshot. We have one, but there were so many screens and we missed the others. And there are more people um, attending now. So. Okay, thank you so much. Welcome back. I think we are all back. Uh, that 10 minutes really flew by. I was so uh, engaged in the discussion in the group that I sat in. I can't believe how quickly it went. Um, but I'm very excited. I really want to thank you, uh, uh, Paul, for taking the time to address those questions. So um, just in the interest of time, I think I'm, I'm th just going to jump in with the feedback sessions. Um, I will nominate the groups and if the leader can then maybe just give us a, a maximum of five minute feedback from your group uh, in terms of the discussions you had, that would be fantastic. Um, if we can please start maybe with the Lions. I'm not sure if it's group three that was the Lions. Um, and I... Um, okay, I see what she does. So I'm not sure if I should just continue. You can yes, continue. please. I think I'm just going to call on, on uh, the, the animal names. <laughs> Thanks, right. John. We, we don't have that description, so it was kind <laughs> of confusing. Um, so we just um, briefly discussed um, some points that came up. In for, for question one, we would um, quantify their admin, admission point score range. Um, am I on the right document now? Um, we wanted to know if they are completing the higher education certificate and how is their engagement before while completing the, the higher certificate and afterwards, what, what does their engagement look like? Um, when are they doing this? What achievements have they obtained and how does their marks look? Um, well, another suggestion was to evaluate the curriculum, observe the requirements versus the requirements of if they want to apply for a different degree versus the um, skills or knowledge they obtained from the higher certificate. So maybe have um, stricter admission requirements. And then we also, also mentioned to quantify the admission point score and measure it up to the NQF level that is already um, pointed out in South Africa. And then we didn't really get time for um, the second question. It was like the last minute. So we just um really quickly said um the number of students that that complete the higher certificate where do the students want to move inside the university once they've completed the higher certificate and then again quantify the admission point score just to get a overall broad view of admissions and that's it from group three three slash cheetahs I don't know if some of my group members want to mention anything else. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you so much to you and your group. Um, I'm very excited. I think there's some, some interesting notes that we are taking. I'm, I'm just making notes. Um, but uh, the, the whole idea of, of um, 
you know, looking at the admission policy, I think this is where it is really critical for us as well. The, the, the indicators that we will need, those that you mentioned, the, the entry requirements, are they successful? What does the curriculum look like? This, all of this will influence our admissions policy. And quantifying uh, the, the admission requirements is, is, is definitely very, very important. Um, and I actually want to speak to you after we've done our presentation of, of what we've done as, as a possible next step to go into that quantification even in more depth. So thank you so much for these valuable contributions. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. Um, okay, so if I can then, so you were, were you group three, the cheetahs, John? Yes, we were group three. Cheetahs. Okay. Cheetahs, yes. Fantastic. Sorry. Okay. Great stuff. So, if we can then maybe move on, um, let's go to group one the elephants. We only just got the time to talk about the first question. Um, so, one of the, uh, there's a couple of indicators that we thought were important for measuring whether a student was going to transition from the higher certificate uh, into the university and be a success at university. So you have the throughput rate through the program, the one-year program, but more importantly, it's the time to completion that would be of interest. If it's a one-year program and the student's taking two years, it's not likely that they are going to be able to um, adapt and cope to uh, the university environment. We also felt that there was an ability to, I mean, the need to understand writing capability. So having a measure of literacy and, and writing and articulation in that sense would be very important for university. Um, then someone was also mentioning that there is a need to have, and this is not necessarily an indicator, but it's an interesting thing to reflect on, that the higher certificate and the way that that program is designed needs to have a relevance or a continuation into the university so that there's no disconnect. Those programs should be very carefully designed uh, to ensure that the, the learner is being prepared for the university. And then as we were leaving the discussion room, we had this brief talk about the age of the learner that is either in entering into the higher, um, the higher certificates or university. And I think this is very interesting to me because I mean, I did field work with matric students and some of them are 21 years old. And if they are leaving and graduating matric at 21, um, it means that they've likely struggled through um, their high school uh, education. It will likely mean that it's going to be harder for them to excel in the higher certificate and university. But it's also interesting, some students may um, have matriculated when they were 18, but taken time to uh, get and prepare themselves and get the necessary um, support in place for them to do the higher certificate, in which case they are a more mature student and may have more drive to succeed um, within their higher certificate and their degree. So I think the, the age could have um, two kind of polar opposite indications of um, students drive for their future success. Um, one looking at the matriculation age and one looking at the age of the um, entry into the higher certificate. So that's, yeah, what we were able to discuss. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much uh, from the elephant. So I can maybe just, just mention um, just on the, the disconnect, and I know the first group also mentioned that in terms of the, the, the curriculum design. At EMS, uh, a student after they or, or completed the highest certificate, they move to the extended program, but they do get, uh, so, so there are similarities between the highest certificate and the extended program. So they do enter the extended program with some of the skills uh, that, that is required um, that would, and, and recognitions that would allow them to get this mainstream qualification that they're wanting to do, let's say BCom economics, uh, within minimum time. But then of course, that's the very big question that, that the elephants also ask. In terms of success, do they do this? 
in minimum time. So that is that is something that we really wanted to look into. Uh, we didn't include anything around age, which I find absolutely so invaluable, um, you know, including that in future, maybe to expand on this, to see what student behavior is specifically in terms of taking that gap and what impact that has on, on student success. So thank you so much for that input as well. Um, then I think let us move on to the next group. If I can maybe ask for group two, the Lions. Hi, sorry, I, I think we're the, yeah, I think we're the Lions. Um, we pretty much, we haven't added anything in addition to what's already been covered by the other two groups. Our conversations were very similar, just looking mainly at the graduation rate and the throughput rate and the success rates. And unfortunately, we, we went, didn't have time to get onto the second question. Oh. Fantastic. So then we're all in the same mind and on the same page. But if at any stage uh, you, you feel that there's something that you want to add, please feel free to do so. Thank you so much um, then, then to the Lions as well. Um, and then group four, the Rhinos. Um, hoping you can see the screen. Um, I must say, so it's Ashton here from the Rhino groups from DUT. And I found the problem statement to be quite interesting because at DUT, our policy is that higher certificates are not a stepping stone to the institution. Um, and we actually had students hold um, the Dean of Management Sciences hostage in their offices, as well as senior management, because the students had this expectation in the beginning of the year that having completed the higher certificate last year, they would automatically be accepted into the formal undergraduate degree programs. Um, so very interesting higher certificates at the moment. And also noting that your higher certificates are self-funded compared to the NESFAS students who would receive funding for their undergraduate degrees. So it was made more complex by the students having self-funded themselves for the higher certificates, thinking that they would then be able to get the NESFAS funding um, after they had been admitted into the formal degrees. So that's a little bit on a side note. In terms of the breakaway questions, um, so some of the data points we looked at was around figuring or calculating their success rates in the next degree. So after they completed the higher certificate and they move on to their next degree, what are their success rates? Um, and then linked to the success rates would be the ability to graduate on time, as well as how many years did it take them to complete? So I think that has been mentioned before. Um, an additional point we brought in was access to employment after graduation. So are the students who've gone and completed a higher certificate more employable and more, um, more easily able to um, get employment as a result of the higher certificate? And then linked to that, is the higher certificate able to build those soft skills better or your graduate attributes so this, that the students have a more holistic student experience and education. And again, that's kind of linked to the employability and the learning outcomes. We briefly had a look at the question two. Um, so we said, well, if students are not graduating or if they're taking too long to graduate or if they drop out, then you're not improving their education. Um, and then again, we raise the issue of employability of the student of, you know, we'll speak to the relevance of the qualifications that they've done at the institution. So I think the additional things we brought in there is around the uh, employability of the students, as well as looking more at the softer skills and the graduate attributes that should have been developed more if they're doing um, more qualifications. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ashton, and to the Lions team. I really appreciate that. Um, just in terms of employment, and then I'll get back to the, uh, uh, I, I want to say the, the, um, 
the discussion, I think, around how higher certificates. But in terms of the employment, 100% agree with you. Um, so our graduation or our alumni offices don't track our higher certificate graduates. We have got no information in terms of the employability or, uh, uh, you know, what happens after they, they did graduate with a higher certificate, and even less so from those that do not. And I think that is something, an area of, of interest that we, that we identified that we also want to follow up with. Um, so, so thank, thank you so much, you know, for, for that qualitative enrichment feedback from the students, from the graduates themselves. So thank you so much for bringing that up as well. But in terms of, and I think that's, that's what you started off with, um, the, the national use of a high certificate, absolutely. So some universities or college or whatever that are using a high certificate as a deep stepping stone, as, as we are seeing happening at EMS in the University of the Free State. And others do have this policy that say, no, it's not allowed. And I think for us, the question back to basics. So we've been doing this for so, so long. Is, is this the right thing to do? Um, is this stepping stone that we are creating the right thing to do? And to be able to answer that and to inform our policy, we need to see, as you, as you mentioned, are they successful? Do they have the necessary graduate attributes? Are, are we contributing to the ed education? Because if they're dropping out, if they're not doing this in minimum time or taking too long, then we're not helping them at all through the stepping stone policy. So thank you so much for, for contributing in that way. Um, and then I think it's the last group that, that we have left, group five, the giraffes, please. Thank you. Hi, sorry, that was my error when I jumped on with the, um, with the lions, <laughs> just to say that the giraffes had covered pretty much what was covered by the other group. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, thanks. So, um, so that was the giraffes feedback then. Um, anyone else from the lion group? All the rhinos, have, have we missed a group? Okay, all right. Okay, guys, so thank you so much for, for your time, for, for adding to our conversation and giving us so much to work with. Um, I think we're very excited, I know I am, after, after this session um, to, to expand on what we have done. But um, if we're mapping out the student life cycle, it is from entry up until graduation. So we, we in our analytics, how we've approached it is we're looking at admission requirements, so students' admission requirements, then their performance throughout. So the performance, the success in their modules, the academic average year on year on year uh, per student up until that point of graduation uh, in a mainstream program. So they're jumping higher certificate extended, extended to mainstream program. Um, and so up until the point of graduation, they're in. Um, in minimum time. So the, the data and the analytics that we're going to share that I'm going to hand over to Sivu, our data analyst now, uh, is, is following that pathway. Um, and then absolutely in line with the discussions in minimum time, graduation in minimum time. So thank you so much for your input. Sivu, it's over to you. Right. Thanks, Anari. I see most groups didn't get an opportunity to discuss around the analytical tools 
that we would use in order to do this analysis. Can I just ask from the group? It doesn't have to be according to your big five uh, allocations in terms of groups. Um, from the people in the auditorium, essentially online auditorium, which tools would you use? Um, and by tools, I include programming languages. I include statistical software. Which tools would you use to sort of um, get started with this analysis? And the reason I'm asking this is because some of the um, data uh, tool selection that we use can have an influence in terms of how much data we share with decision makers, how that data is formatted, etc. So can I just see from the group, it can be anyone, uh, which sort of tools would, would be your starting point in terms of this analysis? Um, I can I can go. Uh, so, in my case, I would use uh, so I started from Excel, Stata, R, Power BI. Uh, uh, that would be my starting point. Any other person? Thank you very much for that feedback. Uh, from my side, uh, uh, SQL, uh, SQL for sure as a starting place, as, as a programming language, if you want to call it that. Thanks. I can also comment from my side. Um... Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, I spoke over you. I see that you're muted. Melanie Hrubler from the Northeast University. So obviously, depending on your warehouse and how you're storing your data, I mean, programming languages like SQL to try and collect all your data using maybe R or SAS for uh, statistical analyses, depending on, on what you're familiar with and what you want to do. And then possibly Power BI um, if you want to display this data in dashboards and so on. But I'm sure there's many other options. I think it just depends on on the, the, the data structuring at your university. Thanks. There we go. So I, I, I like the feedback that we've received so far. The reason I, I asked that question is because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a myriad of tools that one can use that can inform some of the um, decision making that we do and some of the analysis that we do and the results thereof and how we share that as well. Now, within the uh, Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences, when I got um, this analysis from uh, the, the teaching and learning manager and the dean, the very first thing I had to answer was, um, which tool am I going to use? Who am I going to rely on um, to get um, this analysis going? And uh, how do I report it as well? Now, I just want to see, can everybody see my screen? I should have um, data analysis and results. Yes, thank you, Sibu. Perfect. Right, so the first step we took here in order for us to collect this data was to contact our directorate and uh, directorate institute um, for rather the directorate for institutional research and academic planning. It would be rather unfortunate for us to come to SAA and not refer to our directorate that's responsible for data. So we send a request to them and they respond to us with a Microsoft Excel data set. And this data set contains quite a lot of um, information that we use. This includes the NSC results of the students. You would have seen in the feedback from the groups that was an important matter. It also contained the academic progress of the students um, per module over the years. It also contained information on um, which programs the students are registered for in each respective year. And beyond that, we also have an indicator of whether the students has firstly obtained a higher certificate um, qualification, and if so, uh, 
to have they enrolled further in uh, subsequent years and whether or not they have graduated in a mainstream program afterwards. So this is sort of the baseline data that we have to work with. And in order for us to handle this data, we import it into R. And now I go back to the um, question I raised earlier about which tools would you use. R um, is, the, is the programming language we went with, but it doesn't have to be R. I know you can um, do this type of analysis as well in SPSS, you can do this type of analysis in SAS and so forth. The reason we chose R is because it's this uh, programming language that I'm most familiar with, and it's the programming language that um, we use uh, to do this type of analysis. And in R, we have quite a number of packages that we can use to do some of our operations in terms of pre-processing of the data. We have the read Excel package, which helps us with importing uh, Excel formatted data. We have the tidy models um, framework, which contains quite a number of steps that you can use to process our data further. Things like normalizing numeric variables, creating dummy variables, and so forth. And in addition to that, we have um, the MICE package, that's an acronym for multiple imputation by chain equations methods package. Now, the, uh, that package became extremely important to us because I don't know if you would remember earlier, Anari mentioned that we have um, students in our admin uh, cohort, so they go into the higher certificate in administration route that do not have a math requirement. So as a result, our data set had some missing values in between. Now, the first benchmark we had to check there was, is are these missing values um, comprising a value less than 95% of um, the sample that we're working with? In our case, it was well below that. And from there, we had to decide on an um, imputation method. Um, and here we used a random forest uh, uh, equation in order for us to fill in those uh, missing values. If you want to find out more about that, there is a book by Van Proven, 2018, Flexible uh, Imputation Methods Using R, I believe is the title of that book. But eventually, once we're done with the missing value imputation, we then export the data into three tables. Now, I, I heard earlier a mention of um, SQL, and we're basically using that approach um, in terms of separating the data into three different streams. The first um, data set contains the students as they entered the university, so at entry to the university. And then we have a second table that contains the students' academic progress through the years that they registered at the university. And then uh, beyond that, we have graduation status, which is an indicator of whether or not the students has graduated in a um, mainstream program. Because remember, our primary question was around Firstly, is there a path where students are going from higher certificate to um, uh, a mainstream um, graduation? And if there is, what are the sort of predictors that are leading into that? Now, there's a whole host of analysis that one can do. Um, I mean, if you look at the type of data we have here, you could look at uh, panel regression methods, you could look at uh, logistic regression, but in our case we went with survival analysis and the reason for that is survival analysis is analogous to how you would analyze um, the time to an event. So if you think of graduation, you can think of graduation as the event and um, the interval between entry and that time as where our data will be. And the reason we went to survival analysis is it started off in the medical domain, but it's gone on to many other fields. I, I believe there's an article in the Journal of uh, Learning Analytics that actually made use of um, survival analysis as well. Uh, I, I will drop a link on that um, later in the presentation that used um, survival analysis to try and understand the outcomes of students. Now, the workflow that we have in terms of our analysis as follows. We started off with the Kaplan-Meier plot, which provides an overview of the outcomes with students. And within that Kaplan-Meier plot in R, you can actually extract some of the backend data um, that will give you a life table, which will um, indicate to you things like um, how many people are enrolled at a given time, how many of those people subsequently um, unenroll or we don't know their status at any given point and um, the probabilities of success. And then we go on to um, Cox proportional hazards regression, which is a bit more in-depth. So here we're taking these outcomes that we can see from the Kaplan-Meier and life tables, and we're trying to look at what are the odds of graduation based on some of the variables that we have on hand. 
So to start off with, um, I saw in the groups that we were working with, we had quite a number of aspects that we could look at in terms of how uh, students are progressing through the university. And as I mentioned, the Kaplan, my plot and the life tables, you can actually see um, from entry. So we start off with in the administration route, for example, here is, we have a cohort of 2018 in higher administration route. We start off with 128 students in 2018. In the following year, we, are, we, we have some accretion in the number of students that enroll to 94, and then another student unenrolls in the following year to 93, and so on until we have, um, as of 2022, 50 people that we're still observing in terms of their academic progress. And in that time from the table, we can also see how many people are graduating. Now, um, for the first three years, you're not going to see any graduation because um, that's below minimum time. But at year four, we start seeing some graduation. So we start off with um, 33 in 2021 and a further eight graduated in this year for the higher um, certificate in administration route. Now we can display this information in a kaplan meyer plot. In summary, I don't want to get into the esoterics and um, nomenclature when it comes to um, survival analysis, but at, using the kaplan meyer plot, we can look at the probabilities. The probability of graduating um, remains one uh, for the first three years. Remember, we are accounting for essential data as well. And then at year four, we start to see this difference between the higher certificate um, students and the um, higher certificate in administration and the commerce um, route uh, of the higher certificate as well. Now, the next question one might have is, okay, now that you've seen these differences, what um, attributes or what variables are um, leading to these differences? Now, as I mentioned earlier, we, we get our data from the Institutional Research Office, and we are provided with a, quite a number of um, data points on students' academic performance at entry throughout their academic um, uh, period at the university. And then we also have an indicator of whether they're graduating or not. And then the, the next step that we have to decide on um, is which variables do we select to put into our model? Now we're working with a sample of 66 graduations in total across both um, uh, uh, routes in our higher certificate for the 2017 cohort. And then we're also working with um, 45 graduations for the uh, 2018 cohort. And in our variable selection methods, there's quite a number of uh, methods that one can use. You can use um, stepwise regression to select modules and uh, variables rather and compare those models uh, against each other. You can also use uh, penalized regression for uh, Cox proportional hazards, which is, which is what we use, which is a, a shrinkage method that you can use for um, our uh, survival data. So we have to consider the structure of our data is going to be fundamentally different if you were um, trying to do um, linear regression, for example. But ultimately, what we end up with for both cohorts is two models. The first is where we take every mod, uh, every variable that we have and we throw it in there into our model and see what the results look like. The second is um, the more appropriate approach, I would say, where we are looking at the outcomes of our penalized regression uh, for Cox proportional hazards model. And we are only using those variables which are statistically significant in that model and carrying them forward to our, our final model um, which will be in model two. So for each cohort in the results I'm about to show you, for each cohort, you will see model one and model two. So this is for the 2017 cohort. What you find here is in model one, only quintile four schools. So the type of school that the student went to is a statistically significant predictor. And you can see the confidence intervals and so forth below here. And you can see the um, notes in terms of the hazard ratio as well. But if you work with model two, we have three variables that are statistically significant. That is the AP score, the uh, students as they enter. And then we have the route that they take. So did they go through the administration route or the commerce route? And then we have um, and the academic year or rather the academic performance in 2021. Now a note on the academic performance, the academic performance data is based on an aggregate using a mean 
of the academic performance of the year that we, uh, we're looking at. And then we normalize that data as well, um, as mentioned earlier, we normalize that data and we fit it into um, our model. In terms of the interaction about here, um, in terms of the interaction, we had to try and um, model that mathematics mark is not equal to a mathematical literacy model. So we have a dummy variable that indicates um, which uh, uh, mathematics a student took, and we try and account for that. And in each of our models, we don't see that as statistically significant. Now, there are probably ways for us to try and um, impute or rather add additional uh, variables into our, our larger data set. But um, the summary from the 2017 cohort is um, these are the top three variables that come out. Now, if you compare these using um, ANOVA, we see that model two is the better predictor. And we can actually see in terms of the um, estimation in, in the hazard ratios that um, model two is a bit more conservative, which would help us avoid overfitting um, if we were to test this against a test data set. We do the same um, analysis for the 2018 cohort where we're looking at which uh, variables are statistically significant given our data set. Here we have a slightly different picture. Uh, for one, the academic progress uh, and the AP score are statistically significant in both um, models. And we have um, the route that the students are taking. Are they in the admin route or are they in the commerce route is statistically um, significant in the uh, model two as well. Now, when we test these two models um, in terms of their performance using ANOVA, we don't see a statistically significant um, difference between the two. However, again, I want us to look at the um, hazard ratios here. If we are to, um, if we were to test these two models against a, a, a test data set, uh, what we'd look at there is how is it performing at predicting those outcomes uh, for students over time? But overall, I just wanted to highlight that these are some of the variables that we're working with. And the next step for us is, remember, we're trying to look at the full path that students are doing. So uh, from enrollment in higher certificate, um, in which programs are they ending up in? So we go and zoom in a bit more on our uh, cohorts. So let's start here with the 2017 graduation rates for the 2017 cohort. Here we have 61 graduates that um, we're observing. 45 of these graduates initially started in the administration route and the remainder were in the commerce route. What you can see is um, 25 of the 45 graduates graduated in an administration program. So BA administration, uh, uh, B administration, which is offered by our faculty. And then the remainder of those um, students are actually graduating in other programs. So we have one student that has graduated in Bachelor of Administration Honors, others have graduated Bachelor of, of, um, Bachelor of Arts Honors in Film and Visual Media. Um, and when we look at our uh, higher certificate in Commerce, there's a smaller cohort, remember we're working with only 16, majority of whom graduated in our BCom investment management and banking. So what we're looking at in terms of our time range here is minimum time plus one. So as, as of minimum time plus one, this is what our graduation rate looks like among higher um, certificate uh, students. If we move on to cohort, uh, the 2018 cohort, we see a similar trend where our um, higher certificate in administration, 32 of the uh, 44 students graduated in a Bachelor of Administration. Uh, a smaller proportion of them graduated in uh, qualifications such as the BISOC Business Management in Psychology, BISOC Criminology and Psychology, and BISOC Industrial Psychology and Psychology. And if we look at the uh, higher certificate through the commerce route, uh, so far, we've observed two um, students that have graduated in become investment and banking, others in become marketing and BSc uh, statistics and economics. Now, with all this analysis that we've done with the request that we sent to the Institutional Research Office, what are the sort, sort of main takeaways that we can uh, look at? AP score um, is 
appears as statistically significant across our models. Um, the stream that the student is taking appears as significant as well. And then the academic performance. Now, the difference here is in the 2018 cohort, the first year um, academic average is important, while in the 2017 cohort, the final year academic progress is important. And there's all, that in itself opens up a, a, a whole set of questions around uh, why are these differences, are there differences in our uh, in the predictor uh, variables. In terms of qualifications, um, in the higher certificate uh, admin route, uh, we see that most of them are graduating in the Bachelor of Administration. In commerce, we see a bit more diversity in terms of which uh, qualifications they're graduating in. So we see students graduating in the Bachelor of um, Arts, we see students graduating in the Bachelor of um, Social Sciences, and uh, the final group is the Big Home uh, group. I'll hand over to Anne Rie, uh, for the next steps. Uh, sorry, video, there we go. Thanks, Sivu, thank you so much. Um, so I think in summary, what, what, what Sivu shared there, and if we wanna, uh, the next steps and the, the questions that we wanna have answered and the decisions that we wanna make, I think from, from the regression analysis, we clearly see that the whole student life cycle. So the AP score, which is part of the initial, uh, the admission requirements is statistically significant in terms of predicting a student's probability to graduate. Um, so admissions policy, as, as we spoke about earlier, admissions policy decisions uh, can be informed here. Um, then we saw that the different streams that they take. So and this comes to my to my first question there is our higher certificate fit for purpose so with a b admin group we saw that the students that are are graduating following a higher certificate uh, in b admin the majority of the students that are successful do graduate in the the mainstream b admin which is how it is designed what it is designed to do but with a high certificate in commerce, it's a different picture. We see that although it's a smaller cohort, again, asking the question about admission requirements, but we see that the students that graduate and successfully progress and graduate uh, uh, in a mainstream program, the students are not necessarily graduating in an EMS program. Yes, there are portions, but if you count and add up all the the graduations from the from the humanities faculty, then they exceed those in the BCom program. So we see a trend where our students enter the highest certificate in commerce, extended in commerce, and somewhere move, and a very large proportion of our commerce students are moving to the faculty of humanities. Now this begs the question. Um, I think a big difference there is, I'm not saying this is the reason, but this is a, a next step that we can take, is definitely quantifying those admission requirements. But in, in, in terms of the mathematics, our BCom programs have a, a higher mathematics uh, admission requirement than the programs of the humanities. So is that a factor? Is that the type of qualitative feedback that we can get from our students? Um, you know, is that something that is discouraging them from, from going to a, a, an EMS BCom program? So, uh, interesting things that, that we see. So, is our higher certificate fit for purpose? I think when it comes to our higher certificate in commerce specifically, we need to, we need to go back to the drawing board there. We see that our students, that those are that are successful, are not necessarily pursuing a degree within our faculty, although at our institution, but then we need to address the curriculum uh, to either prepare them more intensively, if, if you look at curriculum design there that I have at the bottom, prepare them more intensively with quantitative skills uh, to improve the, the success within the academic progression, ultimately to graduation. Or maybe we should consider interdisciplinary higher certificates. This is something that maybe we, we need to explore. Talk to the Faculty of Humanity, say, listen, this is what we are seeing. We are seeing that our students are preferring. So maybe we should pool resources, maybe put these things together and design something that can have a benefit 
uh, uh, for this particular pathway that the students are following. Benefit for the students. Um, then, of course, another type of decision that this could inform is in terms of our enrollment targets. Where do we want to grow? Again, uh, is is should should we shift uh, 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 targets and resources to our B admin, or should we shift it to our extended enrollment targets, or should we shift it to the mainstream? Should we keep it as is but address curriculum challenges? So all of these things that that we are working through. I think one very important aspect that we that did come uh, 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 from this analysis is the importance of academic advising. Um, we really need uh, to, as a next step, to intensify the academic advising that we provide to our students, specifically in the commerce route, so to help students to identify their appropriate academic career. Um, then in terms of our graduation rates, how can we improve on our graduation rates? As you see, they are not, they are not that bad, but they're not that great either. So how do we improve on our graduation rates? How do I identify these students uh, uh, earlier and provide focus support? So having focus support measures there, resources allocation for those uh, uh, support measures. As I mentioned, I think as a next step, uh, we would really like to enrich this analysis with qualitative data, definitely with the inputs that you gave us from the workshop as well, but some qualitative data as well, targeted at our current students, but also the alumni. Um, as I mentioned, this uh, the alumni in the highest certificates is an area that is not specifically tracked um, and that we have very little information on. So to expand on that, we want to provide some measures of engagement or include some measures of engagement some that one of the groups also mentioned, you know, add some online activity data, for example, that's just one. Um, and then of course the funding that, that the colleague from DUT also mentioned. So what is the funding status of the students ultimately going to mainstream and how is that assisting or not in terms of their success? Um, I think in a nutshell, that is about, that is our story uh, from our side. Um, and thank you for, for listening and, and, and adding to, to our discussions in, in trying to address this, this question that we have. We really, really appreciate your inputs. Um, uh, we, we do have a full report of this analysis that we would love to share. Um, so if you are interested, I'm going to drop my and see this email in the chat box in a moment, but we will share that with you. Or if there's any other feedback or discussion that you would like to have, uh, maybe some additional critique, uh, we would love to hear from you uh, to, to, take this, to take this further. So thank you for your time. I think, um, Elizabeth, we can maybe open up for, for some discussion. Thank you, um, Camelita. I think Camelita was chairing the meeting. Yes, are there I'm with any, you. Yes. Um, are there any questions, comments for yes. Anne Marie and Sabine? I see Ayanda's I, I um, hand is raised. Ayanda. Hi, hi, colleagues. Um, thank you very much for such wonderful presentations. Really, UFS, um, you've really touched on a serious point of concern, um, and and it really impacts us at, at the most, um, especially our universities, where we get high influx of undergrads. Uh, I'm mostly dominated with undergrads um, and from Mango Sutu University. Sorry for for getting the intro, um, and we highly dominant on the undergrad se um, se section, and we do get. Um, you know, a sense of this higher certificate having an effect on, you know, your input, um, your entry level students. So um, my question to you, um, I know you touched on it on the, on the last part, the financial viability. Um, how, I'm just interested to hear how do you now with the results that you've you know have obtained and obviously evidence to back it up um, for presenting to management, how do you 
you know, sway your management into buying into, because there's a, a little bit of an element of difficulty in convincing people that, um, you know, certain departments or certain programs are not viable to, to, to be kept on board simply because they don't um, maybe have a good effect for the business or the organization in the long run. But not to say that they, they don't exist in the academic space um, in terms of HEQSF approval. Yes, they are there and recognized as, as a form of um, qualification in higher education South Africa, but in a sense for the organization itself or institution, it may not be viable to keep them on board. So just an interest to how do you get to sway your, your management into buying into that, <laughs> that feedback or that um, result? Thank you. Very good question, Ayanda. And let me tell you, to be frank, that's something that still is, is in the cards for me. So this <laughs> is one of the next steps. Um, so <laughs> let me tell you, I think the big question here is financial viability. You know, if, if we want to talk financial viability, that's that's not my area of expertise per se. But um, I think I would definitely go back to our directorate uh, for, for institutional research and planning to assist us with the funding model. Um, and and then to determine, listen, if, if we if we compare our inputs our resource allocations to, to our higher certificates. We've mentioned we've got two streams, but we've got many satellite campuses, many facilitators, many lecturers that has to be appointed because of, of the distribution all over the country um, versus what we get at the end of the day in the mainstream program, a subsidy back is that is that worthwhile? And I think that is a very uh, uh, relevant, as you mentioned, topic currently. Um, I think we, we did show, and I think the evidence is there for, for, for both cases. I think it is worthwhile. Um, but then, of course, I think we need the financial financi financials to, to either substantiate that or not. Um, and that is where I will pull in my uh, our institutional research um, division to assist, assist us with such mod modeling. But yes, I think you are raising a very, uh, you know, the, the, the question on our minds as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's quite, quite helpful. Understand. Thank you. I think from a modeling perspective, we, um, though we have the models that we are working with, I think we can still expand on it. So one of the examples I can make here is we still don't know who is funding the students from throughout the period. So you might have a student that might have started out with the uh, bursary funding in the first few years, um, or a student that didn't, didn't have uh, funding for the first few years, and then their funding status changes. Now we need to find a way of modeling for that. One way we could is rather than focusing on a yearly basis, so the results I shared with you are, are based on academic year. How about we look at a semester? Where is the accretion happening? Are we losing students in the first semester or second semester? And that question also leads to, does that have an impact on uh, the viability of the program? If you are accreting students, let's say um, after three semesters versus um, four semesters. So those sort of questions would, uh, I would assume would be asked by uh, management and other stakeholders in terms of viability. So um, from an analytics standpoint, I think we could actually do more modeling, um, looking at uh, obtaining more data. One of the other feedback we got um, in the groups was around um, how engaged are the students. Um, another data point we don't have uh, in terms of uh, the students' performance over the, the years is their access on the learning uh, management system. So how often is their activity in line with the graduates? Are there any statistically significant differences between the activity of the graduates and the non-graduates? Um, what is their current status and so on and so forth. So I think um, more data would be useful for us to investigate in order to feed into the, vi the financial viability um, analysis. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you, colleagues. It certainly um, gives food for thought as well. Thank you so much for that elaborative um, answer. I'm covered. Thank you, Ayanda. Any other questions or comments? Elizabeth, it seems like 
we've come to the end of the session. I'm handing over to you. Um, Thank you very much, Anna-Marian.